So bad story idea. Okay, I'm excited. Uh, this is inspired by listener feedback. Okay, I'm glad you kept going because mm-hmm. this is inspired had me even more worried. <laughs> yeah, the better I think they are, the worse they usually are. So <laughs> this one is awful, so maybe it'll be just awesome. Okay. Uh, so I was reading some feedback to our Suck Fairy episode where we mm-hmm. talked about how sometimes beloved items from our childhood, um, we read them as adults and we realize someone has mysteriously replaced the excellent thing that we loved yeah. with a very bad imitation of it that is no longer funny, charming, and might actually be a bit racist. Exactly. The yeah. thing we loved as kids mm-hmm. uh, is still wonderful. Yes. In an alternate dimension somewhere. Yeah. But the sock fairy visited it. Well, uh, someone made a comment about George Lucas. Okay. Uh, being his own sock fairy. Uh, good comment. <laughs> Uh, person who uh, who made this uh, this comment, and I responded with a what be, has become a bad story idea, which is a time traveling filmmaker named Luke Georges. Okay, no relation. It's already terrible. <laughs> who is so embarrassed by how bad his modern works are that he's going back in time to take everything great from the era before and make it suck. So he can't make great art, so he's just going to lower everyone else's art. Okay, so he's not ruining his own. No, he's ruining everyone else's. everything. He's going to go back except except for his. And so, you know, this isn't George Lucas because he actually made some legitimate great things, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Yeah. It's it's imagine some mediocre filmmaker an Uwe Boll, if you will, Uwe Boll, who uh, Brett Ratner. Yes, is like man, everyone. Talks about how mediocre I am. What if everything they were comparing me to was awful? So they go back and ruin Citizen Kane, right? Yeah. Go back and ruin Star Wars. Go back and ruin everything great. Everything. Yeah. Godfather, you know, um, it's it's a time <laughs> travelers ruining other people's stories to come back to hope, you know, and then you have, you could play some butterfly effect thing mm-hmm. or, yeah. That is... Honestly, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. First note is I want to change his name to Luke Gorgeous. Luke Gorgeous, okay. Yeah. That's a good name. That's uh, And yeah. that's totally a name that Uva Bull would give himself if yes. he didn't already have a cool name like Uva Bull. Yes. Um, also, what this, what this calls to mind is like the John Carter effect, mm-hmm. right? Oh, I don't like, know what you mean by this. Well, and I don't think that's what it's actually called. That's just how I think of it. Um, the... The Mars books, the Barsoom books by Edgar Rice Burroughs, inspired, mm-hmm. directly inspired right. so many things, including, you know, uh, by the time he got to Return of the Jedi, George Lucas was was ripping it off wholesale yeah. rather than just I was uh, shocked piecemeal. when I ran across the Sith in the Barsoom books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the word, oh, the word Jedi... Mm-hmm. Um, the airships with the, you know, leather bikini, like everything is straight out of the Barsoom books, which means that by the time- Maybe it was Jedi I ran across, not Sith. Uh, no. He did, he took both, both. of them. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the time people saw the John Carter stuff made into a movie, it looked repetitive and cliche because someone else- Right. Had they they'd seen the adaptation before they'd seen the original. This is a very cool topic. I want to talk some more on this, but I yeah. disagree with a lot of uh so mainstream media does not like the John Carter movie. Mm-hmm. I also do not like the John Carter movie, <laughs> but we dislike it for different reasons. For different and reasons. nerd um sort of um what do you cult classic people have come to love the John Carter movie. And I don't mm-hmm. like it at all. Okay. Um, and I don't know if we're going to disagree on this, but I was very excited for it. Uh, I enjoy the books, uh, and I thought that the movie was a travesty. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think it was a travesty. I enjoyed it. Uh, it's definitely not how I would have done it. Um, I've had long conversations with Melinda Stodgrass, who wrote the first draft that they ended up not using. Okay. And I like her version a lot more. Uh, but, yeah. I think I see it partially as a tra- tragedy because um, travesty, tragedy, it's both. It's both. Um, it, it's a tragedy. 
uh, <laughs> you are no longer working in your corporate job where you have to combine words. No, and so no, I'm, you're, I'm you're out rusty. Of my yeah. uh, element now. Yeah, that was uh, that was totally out of practice. Definitely not stew bad level. No, that good. was not. I mean, in fact, was a stew bad portmanteau <laughs> of tragedy and travesty. But um, oh man. Lost my cool train of thought. Cool train of thought. Cool you were saying that uh, in that that the movie is a travesty slash tragedy. Oh, because... in part because the director um, is somebody that I really wanted to see succeed. This mm-hmm. is one of the Pixar guys mm-hmm. um, who tried to make a leap to um, live action. It's yeah. Andrew Stanton. He did Wally, which I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he obviously is a great director. And this was a passion project for him. And part of why I was so disappointed is because I had such high expectations, right? Because classic story that has never had a big budget adaptation that I enjoyed reading mixed with a director who's legitimately done great things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it was just kind of meh. And it made one big mistake. I mean, I think it made several big mistakes, but which one are you referring to? It made John Carter boring. Oh, it turned yeah. him into a generic action hero with a tragic past. Mm-hmm. And what makes the John Carter books work for me, and I'm sure they work differently for other people, is that you read these books about a barbaric society with a man in a loincloth sometimes jumping from ship to ship, cutting the heads off of four-armed bug monsters, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, lizard monsters, whatever. And his voice is a southern gentleman. Like yeah. straight out of Civil War letters written home. Uh, he is so interesting and beautiful and flowery language not matching the base sort of uh, tone of the rest of the story is just transfixing to me. <laughs> uh, and so mm-hmm. when they took him and said, no, he's got to be like every other action hero. He's got a dark, tragic past. He broods. He's got a, he, he's, he's a, he's a, on a hero's journey, and so he's got to have, you know, this, I don't want to be on this journey, as opposed to the guy in the books who's like, oh, I'm on Mars and can jump real far? Wow, this is real fun. Can I save a princess? Hey, there's one in trouble. There's one right there. And then, yeah. like, so much fun to mm-hmm. read that character's voice yes. um, that I just could not get over that. Um, maybe it would have flopped if they'd done that. Maybe that would have flopped too. I mean, you know, that's, maybe they made that change because the world is and setting is very weird. So it's like, let's give everyone a protagonist who's like all the protagonists they've had before. But that, that was my big problem yeah. with that movie. Um, there, there are a ton of reasons that that movie collapsed and failed. Uh, and we don't, necessarily need to get into them right now but i will say dear listener Ooh, get into them there's a book called uh mm-hmm. john carter and the gods of hollywood that uh-huh. charts the entire process of making the movie and what happened and why it happened and all of the things um a lot of it comes down to it was in production during the time that disney acquired disney and marvel at which point they said you mean lucas and marvel uh, yes, mm-hmm. Lucas and Marvel, not Disney yeah. and Marvel. Uh, and so Disney was like, well, we've got this one really cool, successful adventure thing that appeals to a certain demographic. We don't need two and killed John Carter. That's one of the many reasons. But mm. the larger point and the reason I bring that up uh, is because regardless of the s- quality of the John Carter movie, mm-hmm. it was seen as... Derivative. Derivative, even though it was the thing that inspired all the things people think it is derivative of. I was so worried that would happen with Dune. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm glad that that didn't happen. I mean, I think part of it is the beautiful artistic direction, making people, giving people something they haven't seen before, mm-hmm. uh, even if the, the tropes are things they have seen repeated and copied. Um, the fact that, you know, yeah. yeah. So, back to your bad story bad idea. Bad story idea, yeah. Um, I, I, I love the idea that this guy's just going around, like, sneaking behind the scenes yes. of the Godfather, the like, fairy. screwing it up. Like, in real right? life, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, but I'm also wondering if, like, if you wanted to tank Star Wars, mm-hmm. could you just, like, 
assassinate Edgar Rice Burroughs. And then Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, Star Wars, right. like an entire, like two or three generations worth of science fiction nerds would have been inspired by something else instead of by this. See, I've they, got, they might have eventually yeah. still made really awesome movies, even though they would have been about different things. Yeah, that's a way you could take this is mm-hmm. he tries and then just new cool things have arisen. Uh, and each time he tries yeah. to, you know, everything else, there's this uh, there's this philosophy that I like. Um, I actually talk about it in one of the secret projects and kind of a little aside um, (laughs) that society is kind of waiting and poised for uh, entertainment revolution and scientific revolution. It's Mm -hmm. not one person. It's like a movement that's oftentimes people come to the forefront. Uh, The phrase I, I use, it's like, you know, Beatles didn't create modern rock modern rock created the Beatles, right? This idea that there needed to be somebody there. That doesn't take away from the fact that they were legit geniuses, but it's like society was looking for a genius to take and And elevate. picked them. And picked them. There actually, there was a really cool uh, research paper recently about um, the Beatles and basically imagining a world in which someone else had just randomly been chosen Right. By society as the big hot thing and what would have happened to the Beatles and, and how would life be different. It was really cool. I can't remember it, though. I can't like the name of it or the author or anything. We should talk about Yesterday sometime, the movie. Have you seen it? I did. Yeah. Um, it ha- that That is such a weird movie for me because, again, first it has Lily James in it, who yes. I have already expressed my devotion to. Um, that movie has like three transcendently perfect scenes in it mm-hmm. and everything else is terrible <laughs> terrible really oh man that okay. is not a movie that has any idea what it's trying to say or where it's trying to go i have some insights in that having read up a little on it but let's finish john carter of mars and okay we we're talk yesterday okay um so spoilers for yesterday coming up <laughs> um but um bad story idea back to bad story back idea. to bad story idea what if this suck fairy guy we're using modern deep fake technology, making bad versions of the movies and going replace it and replacing the prints before they go and ship out. So the movie that ends up getting shown is not the one they actually made. Okay. And is like actually suck fairing, right? Like you somehow going in when a great work of fiction <laughs> is going to be printed and changes it. So with a, with a modern you know, computer generated version. I love that mm-hmm. because it does give us the John Carter problem from a yes. totally different direction, which yeah. is this guy, Luke Gorgeous, he is making his own version of King Kong and right. Citizen Kane and Casablanca and all these other things. And then he gets into the future saying, I have lowered the level of overall expectations to the point that my movie is now seen as wonderful instead of mediocre. Yeah. And he arrives back in the present to find that everyone is calling him derivative because he's obviously ripping off all of these shots and camera angles and things. Right, from, that he came up with. That he came up with oh, in his genius. fake versions of the other ones. Oh, man. We could drive this poor guy crazy. <laughs> well, he's not that this poor because he's trying to ruin uh, society. Now, see, this is a book that I would almost want to write in parts. Mm. Like, you know, three or four parts where he, they're just iterations of him. Like, this yeah. is how I'm going to ruin art. Yeah. And it doesn't work. And he goes back and tries a different tactic. Right. It's like four novellas increasingly or disrupt novelettes. the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. That, that actually just... kind of sounds like a Dan book. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> and every you know, time he gets back to the version. present, art has been ruined, but also something else is completely different. Like well, he's destroyed, for example, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Yes, and so the thing that took off and inspired people was actually cowboys instead of fantasy adventure right. space fiction. So we don't get Flash Gordon. We don't get this other stuff. We get I don't know pirates. Well, that was uh, that's Watchmen. That is. Man, that's true, that's, huh? That's the, one of the concepts Pirates of Watchmen. Of superheroes. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite parts about Watchmen is that idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, the black freighter, is that what it's called? Uh, story so. within a story. I just yeah. love um, <laughs> that. This is just an aside, just me gushing, but that shot in Watchmen where it goes panel and panel zooming in on the comic and zooming in on the kid's eyes as he's reading it, uh, I just love. Um, so... Yes. Anyway, uh, let's talk about yesterday. Yes, you, you, I. What are your transcendent scenes in yesterday? Okay. 
Uh, the really perfect and beautiful scenes. Uh, okay. First of all, when he plays yesterday for his friends. Yes. That is astonishing. It is. And it's even in the trailer, mm -hmm. and it doesn't lose any of its power yeah. when you see it in full, and you're like, oh, I've seen this scene already. It still hits you like a truck. Um, later, he does um, the long and winding road in the... The right. big scene where with he's Ed Sheeran. with Ed Sheeran, yep. where they're doing like a songwriting competition in in Russia or wherever, um, and then what was the other one? See, I thought that scene was a little forced. Really? Yeah. The idea, like Ed Sheeran, is obviously a good sport, um, <laughs> but the yeah. idea that he'd be like, "We're gonna have a songwriting competition and like you know write it in in one hour," and like who would do that? Right. Well, see, I don't necessarily believe that that yeah. happens, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I'm not a famous songwriter. Maybe that does happen. I, I mean, don't know. I don't know. It it, it felt like a stretch. It, to it me. was definitely goofy. Yes. Uh, but I did love. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that they they did it very well. The mm -hmm. the way that Ed Sheeran does his song, and you're like, oh, that's actually an amazing song. Mm -hmm. You know that they used for this, and I don't know Ed Sheeran well enough to know if that's something he wrote for the movie or if right. it already existed in the world. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and then uh, our hero, yeah, gets up and he sings "Long and Winding Road," and you're mm -hmm. like, oh my word. Uh, and then the last scene is when he meets John Lennon. I like that scene a lot. And he's just like a guy who's become like a painter, and he lives in a lighthouse. And mm -hmm. um, it, it was it was astonishing. I thought I loved for a it. minute that they were going to get Paul McCartney as himself as himself to play. Yeah, and I wonder if the screenplay had. But it makes I, more sense if it's it John. It Makes more sense for yeah. for Lennon because of yeah. the assassination. Yeah. Uh, it would have been nice to have McCartney because mm -hmm. he would be able to play himself. Yes. I guess Ringo could too, but yes. nobody ever wants him. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ringo. Um, Not but even the best drummer. Other than the that, like it doesn't it doesn't do anything. Like the movie does have this very tepid mm -hmm. kind of love story in the background, uh, where, you know, whatever arc it has is the mm -hmm. arc of him realizing that he doesn't need all the fame of being a famous rock star because he has this woman who loves him, mm -hmm. who has no personality of her own whatsoever and is entirely a gear inside of his love story and is hopelessly and eternally devoted to him for reasons we can't fathom because he's a jerk. Um, and that, I guess... I don't think he's I mean, a that's, jerk. That's the Here's biggest the thing. thing. I don't think he's movie. a jerk. I think he's a schlub. <laughs> And those are a different schlub. things. Yes. Okay. I will grant you that he is a schlub, not a jerk. Um, I don't think the movie adequately deals with uh, him stealing other people's work and claiming it as his own. Uh, I think that that is a really fascinating angle that the movie didn't adequately deal with. Uh, when he is about to be called out on it, mm -hmm. you know, there's the woman in the back of the yeah. concert who holds up a yellow submarine, yeah. and I was like, oh, they are going to go there. And then they didn't. It was just like there's four other people who also right. remember the Beatles and they were happy to find each other. End of plot line. Nothing. I'm going to go opposite of you on this. I like that. Oh. I was expecting, it was so obvious, a move, that mm -hmm. that zig instead of zag is the one zig in the whole movie that I really liked. Um, they, that I'm like, I mean, what else is he supposed to do? Right? <laughs> Like, well, no, no, I, don't exist. I'm with you Why, there. If I were her, those people, I would think like that. But in a movie, people don't. People are like, I went, <laughs> I loved that they got there and like, actually, we're just happy someone's singing songs because there's no albums of them anymore and we can't hear our favorite See, music. And, and that was a nice mm -hmm. swerve. Yes. If they had followed it somehow. But to me, it just felt like here is a plot line. Haha, mm -hmm. ha, we're not going to do it. And also, key to the whole problem, we're not going to replace it with anything more interesting. I mean, there is... So, I have some behind the scenes having read up a little bit on okay. it. Okay, I'm excited um, to hear this. The original screenplay was for a guy um, written by a screenwriter who was shopping his screenplay around and was not able to sell it. Uh, this is the actual story of the screenwriter mm -hmm. okay. um, of yesterday. And... Once said to his friends, he's like, I don't know. I think it must be me. I could have Star Wars and no one would buy it from me. And that sparked the idea. And he wrote a really, from what I can tell, not having read it, interesting but depressing take on someone has the Beatles. 
but no one recognizes the genius of them. Mm-hmm. Be- and it really is him. It's the si- so, uh, the singer has the best songs in the world. No one's ever heard them, and he still can't make them popular. And that concept, ruminating on that, is really interesting, right? It's not that already sounds more interesting than the than the movie that got made. But that's a movie for Dan. <laughs> that is not a movie for the rest of the world. Granted, yes. <sighs> and My, so rah. they got a hold of it and said, "Wow, this is depressing." This is a great concept, but it's super depressing. And they basically booted that guy who's kind of uh, annoyed by the whole thing. Well, I, yes. with, yeah. And he, then, he wrote a, an entire screenplay about yeah. how he's the worst part of all the art he's involved in. And then, he got and then he gets kicked off of his own art. Yes. So, yes, that's terrible. And they decided to hire someone else who didn't read it at all. Mm-hmm. They didn't give it to him and said, write a romantic comedy based around this premise. And that's what uh, and that's ended what up getting made. made. Um, See, so. th- that original premise has a conflict, though. Mm-hmm. And the movie that got made, to me, was just a jukebox musical, ultimately devoid of story or meaning. And that bothered me. I can't disagree with that, but I found it just fun, right? Yes. I probably also would have preferred the other one because it's very writerly. Uh, to do the other one. It, it's very, I, I, I guess what that one has and the real one doesn't, which is what I as a writer wanted, was to treat it like a science fiction premise. Right. Rather than like a romantic comedy. Right. And I am not opposed to romantic comedies. We did a whole episode mm-hmm. on Pride and Prejudice. I love them. Mm-hmm. But I wanted some some more postulations, some more what if, some more actually looking at what, would be different. I would like have liked that as well. Uh, but I don't mind what we got is the thing. That's the thing. You do, <laughs> and I, I can do. totally see this. You're looking at it in Canny Valley and being like, it's so close to being something that mm-hmm. would have been very Dan. I do have two big problems with the movie. Okay, let's hear them. Uh, the first one is when this happened in the movie. So if you haven't seen the movie, um, at some point, the girlfriend who has been absolutely devoted to him, I don't agree with your... Like, they're both just kind of schlubs. And she likes him because I think he is kind of nice. And he has a little bit of talent. And they're, like, going to do this thing together. Um, He's a likable guy. Um, I think he, the actor, plays it perfectly because he's just enough of a schlub. He's very good in Um, the role. and have to give him credit. Transforms into movie star as soon as he starts doing the Beatles music, which is a really cool thing to see. Mm -hmm. Um, It really is basically him stepping back and elevating the source material, but you know there has to be a lot of skill to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he's basically a schlub, and she's like, you know, a roadie slash manager. We're going to make it big, but really, we're just doing this thing together that we love. Uh, And he can't grasp the, we're just doing this thing together that we love, and, and has his heart set on stardom. What I didn't buy is once he got successful, her not being willing to go along with it, right? Like, mm-hmm. yes, we're just doing this thing together, but when you it actually strike gold, like if you've poured your heart and soul into it, that's part of what felt like it took away vol- volition from her is this idea of her yeah. not just going, being there, right? Uh, and granted, it would still be orbiting him, but uh, I, I leaned over to Emily when I'm watching the movie and I said, why is it that successful and happy in films can never be simultaneous, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, I am a reasonable, su- reasonably successful person, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I have hit it big like people in these movies have. Mm-hmm. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the dream that everybody wants, right? Um, to be top of your field and have everything you want. And I'm also pretty happy. Yeah. Right? Like this whole money doesn't buy happiness thing. Maybe it didn't, but being successful is sure helpful in your self-esteem and, Mm -hmm. you know, doing a job you like every day. And that's really important. And I mean, I have a wonderful wife and a great family and it all works. And sure, there's tensions, but... In yeah. movies, anytime someone gets successful, it's like, oh, the success will ruin them. Success like, will ruin everyone. Uh, which is especially hilarious to me that uh-huh. this is coming from Hollywood. Yeah. Right? Like, mm-hmm. Hollywood always makes movies about 
you know, getting back to small town values mm-hmm. and success will ruin you and all these things. And meanwhile, all of these movies are made by people who live in Los Angeles yes. and, and work in Hollywood. And are successful. <laughs> yeah. I, it, that really bothered me. A tangent to our tangent. Um, so, um, won the Oscar. Uh, dancing, dancing, dancing. La La Land. La La Land. La La Land. So, which uh, I haven't seen. You haven't seen? Oh no! I was no. just going to take us on a cool La no, La Land please tangent. Do a La La Land tangent. I watched the opening scene where they're dancing on the freeway, mm-hmm. and for some reason, that by itself was like, I do not have time for this movie Man, it's anything a, it's a great movie it. okay it is my wife also loved it i don't know why that scene bothered me so much it is trashed because it's just kind of a somewhat happy feel good movie ish mm-hmm. um and people say it won the oscar because it's about hollywood which maybe it did and things but spoilers for la la land okay five four three two one spoilers has an unhappy ending okay which is well, now I want to see it. It which is awesome, and it's an unhappy, realistic ending, um, which I love about that movie. Um, because what it is is they both find the success they want, but it causes them kind of to drift apart. And rather than saying, you know, whatever your small town values thing, mm-hmm. uh, let's throw it all. They both go on with their careers, and she marries somebody else. He, I think, is still single at the end. Um, and they, they both go on to great success in their own. I mean, for him, it's owning a jazz club. It's not like he's, you know, massively, hugely successful, but he's successful yeah. and happy in a work fulfilled way. She goes on, you know, and becomes a movie star and, uh, and marries another guy who's very ha- leading man esque, mm-hmm. um, and things like that. And at the end, she imagines what their life would have been like as small town family values thing um, and kind of says, oh, oh well. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly <laughs> like that, but just kind of this is where it could have gone. Yeah. It's one of those endings where you don't know if the movie is saying they really should have stuck together and gone you know, with, with this direction or if it's saying uh, that's a dream that probably never would have happened. They weren't right for each other. And it was good that they met and then drifted apart. Um, but mm-hmm. it's a it's a really fascinating take on this whole concept. And the ending makes the whole movie work for me. See, that's awesome. And I mm-hmm. love that kind of mm-hmm. ending to a love story. Yeah. Uh, I, I Old, old deep cut, uh, The mm-hmm. Wonder Years. That's how the Wonder Years ended. I did. Did not you ever see watch the, the Wonder Years? My P- or health teacher showed us <laughs> many clips from the Wonder Years in health class for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, that is the most Wonder Years I have ever watched is in health class. Well, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, so the Wonder Years was in the eighties, a mm-hmm. look back like nostalgia for the sixties kind of thing. Yep. Uh, it's total boomer all the way. Uh, but you know, my parents were boomers, so we mm-hmm. watched it. And at the very end of it, um, you know, part of it has been this love story. And they're all, they're like 10 or 12 years old, these right. kids. And uh, Fred Savage has been in love with uh, Danica McKellar. I don't remember the character names. Her name is mm-hmm. Winnie. Okay. Uh, and throughout, it's been this kind of star-crossed lovers, I'm so in love with the girl next door kind of thing. Uh, and then the final episode, she's going off to like go to college in France or something Mm -hmm. and he promises he'll meet her in the airport and then the voiceover narration said and four years later I did with my wife and our child Um, and I love that and so many people were like no they were meant to be together and I just think nobody marries the person they were in love with when they were 10 obviously there's like a tiny percentage that do and so yes the one person in our YouTube comments is going to yell at me for it because you're statistically improbable. Um, <laughs> and I love that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. I have put that into my own books and I've had readers get mad at me like, why didn't this person end up with this person? Well, because they're teenagers and... And because I even didn't if they want them to. Teenagers, a lot of time, two good people having a romance can find that it just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, and move yeah. on and... That happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, La La Land, good example of, of this. 
a lot of people, it's 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 trendy to hate on La La Land. I can kind of understand why, but I think the ending makes it work. Okay. It makes it knowing makes you that wonder. that's the ending mm-hmm. makes me want to watch it now. Yeah. So so there you are. Um, I'm a bad person who likes sad things. Uh, what was I had the topic second... we were originally supposed to talk about? We won't about? even get there because <laughs> I have a second problem with yesterday. Okay, tell us your other problem with yesterday. My other problem with yesterday is that the smart thing for him to do from day one, he's conflicted. Oh, mm-hmm. these aren't my stories, but he finds out they don't exist. It's just to say, yeah, um, I go to sleep and I wake up remembering these songs written by these four guys who were really big geniuses and I just channel them. Everyone thinks he's an eccentric weirdo who makes brilliant music. His conscience is clear. Uh, he can say that all he wants. Um, he can donate some of the money if he wants, but I mean, I don't think the Beatles would care. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not sure. But in that cir- circumstances, like I wouldn't care if I don't, you know, um, yeah. it, it's, it's this alternate reality in dimension and you see into it and you're sharing my work with people from this dimension. Okay. Like you could be perfectly honest and still be rich and famous and everyone just thinks that you're a weirdo. Okay. So how much more fascinating would that movie have been if the entire thing was from the point of view of a 75 year old John Lennon <laughs> who realizes that the most successful musician in the world is singing music and playing music that he attributes to you from an alternate dimension. That would be the most Uh? Dan version possible. (laughs) That movie would never get made. And if it was... But it would be so cool. (laughs) But anyway, I feel like it's... I think that a lot of people would just say this and be like, I maybe I have, I need to see a psychologist. Something's weird with me. And they would just be like, look... You have some interesting um, mental illness that we can't quantify. You remember people that didn't exist, but you also are a legit musical genius. And then you get to live your life without without feeling like you're, <laughs> you know. Well, and that, of course, raises uh, one of the many questions that the movie doesn't deal with, mm-hmm. which is the guy, you know, searches far and wide for the Beatles and can't find them. But at no point until the very end does mm-hmm. he try to actually find the dudes. Like yeah. contacting John Lennon, Paul McCartney, any of the four mm-hmm. uh, would have been so interesting to see early on. But the movie's like, I don't have time for that. I need to do all this other stuff. Should we mention Woody Harrelson since, you know, haven't brought up the fourth Be- Beatle? Oh, I mean, George Harrison. <laughs> the- <laughs> I don't know. We hadn't mentioned George Harrison. We hadn't right? mentioned George Harrison. Yeah. We've, Sorry, We've mentioned everyone. all the other Beatles. All the others. And, you know, he was involved <laughs> uh, a little bit, you know, with... George Harrison. Didn't he write... He wrote um, some of my very wrote, favorite Beatles Here Comes songs. the Sun, didn't he? Wrote, he wrote Here Comes the Sun. And that's one of my favorites. With Eric Clapton. Yeah. He so. wrote Something in the Way She Moves. Mm-hmm. He wrote uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorites also. Have you yeah. heard the ukulele version? By, um, I have not, but I am also of the opinion that the ukulele version of a song is inevitably not as good as the original version of the song. This one is better. That's impossible. It is so amazing. I'm not down on the ukulele. It's by a Hawaiian, I'm I de- believe. He's of course, got a it's by a Hawaiian Japanese last person. name. So he's um. So he might be Japanese. He might be Japanese American. He might just be. Yeah. You know. Does um, he at least change the lyric to "While my ukulele it is gently weeps"? Only acoustic. Um and no. He doesn't no use vocals. an electric ukulele. Uh, huh? He doesn't use vocals. It's oh, only okay. well, not acoustic, but um, it's only instrumental. No, instrumental. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jake, um, I will not be able to pronounce his last name accurately. Okay. Um, but is uh, it the the somewhere over the rainbow guy? Or is no, it no, no. Guy? That's is. Uh, is is awesome. But this is uh, this is something mm-hmm. different. I'm gonna I'm gonna make you listen to this okay. version. You're gonna make me listen to I'm, it, and I'm gonna and you're gonna like it just, on principle yes. because I'm being forced to listen uh-huh. to it. Yeah. Um, I listened to your K-pop and told you how great it was. Well. That's because it's awesome. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I can't argue with that. I love ukulele music that is its own thing. Mm hmm. But uh, I'm not a fan of ukulele remakes. Okay. This one just is really good. 
Um, you know, I uh, I wish I could find. Maybe the the comments can find this tangent to our tangent to our tangent. Yeah, that has to be the title of this episode at this point. Yeah, we were going to talk about smartphones. Yeah, we were <laughs> legit going to talk about smartphones. for real. The topic we set for ourselves. Yeah, this is uh, thirty seven minutes ago. What uh, this this is this is what Adam <laughs> uh, suggested to us as a topic, and this is where we go. Um, but uh, I can't find any really cool sort of ambient Hawaiian music like. The lo-fi hip-hop version of Hawaiian music. Um, like trance? Yeah, like trance Hawaiian. I wish there were some trance Hawaiian. Um, Sim okay. 5 has a really good one on the soundtrack. It's the Polynesian theme. Okay. Uh, it's really cool. And I'm like, I want more stuff like this. Just kind of, you know, um, not vo- no vocals, just kind of quiet and uh, and uses... The ukulele and some local instruments and stuff can't find it, so hmm. I feel like it's got to be out there, right? I assume, dear um, listeners, if you know any trance ambient Hawaiian ukulele music, yeah, please hook us up. Yeah, hook us up with some <laughs> lo-fi ukulele. Um, yeah, you know, tangent to the to the question of of ukulele remakes. Do you find? Because I know you like me listen to mashups or at least used to when we were in college and listened Mm -hmm. to mashups all the time um i find that when i hear a song Mm -hmm. in mashup form for the first time the original version inevitably seems smaller yeah i agree and i'm like "Eh, this isn't as cool it doesn't have all the stuff in it i think it's just because um when you find a new song that earworms in and it feels epic to you Mm -hmm. and awesome and you want to listen to it again and again, it shrinks over time because you don't have that same emotion. Shrinking is the great, a great term for it. Yeah. Uh, You still love the song. It's still a great song, but you've, you've worn those pathways in your brain and then a mashup takes the same music and makes the pathways new again. And so it goes back to being what it was. And so it does, isn't the, the the original song has changed. It's just that you uh, can experience that song again anew. Well, I think it's also the mashup version has more stuff in it. Mm-hmm. So when you listen to the mashup first, the original yeah. inevitably has less. Yeah. Which is not to say that it is worse. No. Quantity and quality are different things. Yeah. Um, favorite mashup? Favorite mashup? Mm-hmm. Uh, over the confluence of giants by DJ Earworm. Okay, I'm gonna have to listen to that. I haven't. I, I don't know that one. It's one of these that has like he's mashing up like ten different things. Yeah. But it's There's, very good. I'll, I'll have to listen to that one. Uh, you could say that the is um over the rainbow mashup, um uh, because it's mashed up with uh what a beautiful world. Yeah, or, it's mashed uh, up with a few, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is probably the most popular mashup of all time. I would guess. Um, I yeah, really yeah, like, yeah. there's a, there's a mashup between a Taylor Swift song and a oh, corn Nine Inch song. Nails? Corn. Oh, okay. Corn? Uh, because, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Shake It Off and Perfect Drug. I've heard that one. That one's very that good. That one's really good. I prefer this one. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Which, I which like, corn song? So is it? it's the corn song, um, let's see. Uh, the Taylor Swift song is I'm Never Gonna Get Over You or I'm Never Ever Whatever. Uh, Gumming Back to You. Is that what it is? It's um, not one I'm familiar with. Let me, uh, let's, let's. And I have two teenage daughters, so I'm yeah. familiar with most Taylor Swift songs. Uh, Corn plus Taylor Swift. I'm looking this up because I want to. Um, I want to um, do this. Um, yes, it's by. Isosign, Isonsign, I S O N S I N E. Okay. Um, and um, da, 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 da. we are coming undone. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, that's one I have to listen to. I really like it. Something about it, just you know, I love the the mashups between genres that end up working. Yes. Agreed. How's that, Ben?